when my daughter was little, I can remember taking her to one of uh, a seminar or something that I was giving her. And, uh, she was sitting in the front row, she must have been about uh, nine or ten. And I put something like this up on the, on the, on the, on the wall. And uh, she looked at it in great glee and went, Daddy! White man petroglyphs. <laughs> so I'm putting up some white man petroglyphs for you uh, in order that you can see and listen to some of the things I want to talk about. But one of the questions that I've been hearing as I've been listening and talking around to people is, is that this whole concept of, of traditional knowledge and how difficult, oh, how do we integrate it? How do we do that? And you've heard a couple ideas and, and suggestions about it from the beginning. And one of the best suggestions was that concept of listening. Uh, a lot of cases, we do what we say. And so when I was saying, somebody said to me, how, I'll give you an example. At Aquazusti, we use the words that come before all else as our environmental framework for doing environmental assessment. Great. You know, you look at the people and see how the project's going to impact. You look at the earth, well, we do that too. Geology, geomorphology, whatever. Uh, do we want to look at the water? So, yeah, we have to look at that. <laughs> and so this becomes the way in which we assess. The problem is, by the time you get down to the end here, non-natives, other people in the world, have no tools. They can't measure something. They think, how am I going to know what the impact of Grandmother Moon is going to be on my gas station? You know, but there is an impact. Why? Because the Grandmother Moon represents the women in our communities. And the men in our community want to make sure that that gas station feels accessible to them so that they can use it and feel safe there as well. So we have to take that into account. And when you get down further, into the sun, moon, and stars, like I said. Again, you may be talking about night skies, darkness. Why darkness is important? Why is it to us? Because we have a legend about our creation story in which there were two brothers, one the brother of light and the brother of dark. Neither of them were good or evil. It was all in relationship to what they did. So the good brother, creates rivers, he makes them nice and straight, and they only flow it, and they flow in two directions. Easy, eh? Ah, for us, that would be wonderful. Hey, go down one side in the morning, come back the next side. So the elder brother looked at and said, oh, man, those people are going to get real lazy if they do that. Let's put some curves in it. So he made great big curves in it, made them only going one way, so in the morning you could go down nice and easy and have to fight to get back. Well, that challenges you, challenges you to live in the world. Is that a good thing or is it a bad thing? And so the Hoda showing are always looking at those two brothers to see who and what it is. So this night sky is a good portion of the world. It's ruled by that dark brother, but it's not bad. Uh, interesting to me that in Poland uh, they had uh, night skies that they used to light up like crazy. And they said that the reason they did this was to keep crime low. Okay, and that sounds reasonable, right? If you put a big light out, you're going to be able to see the crooks and the burglars, and you're going to be able to capture them quite tightly. When they turned off the lights in Poland, because they didn't have enough power recently to maintain them, crime rates went down. Why? Burglars can't see at night. <laughs> they need a big flashlight. What happens in total darkness when you turn a flashlight on? Somebody 16 miles away can see. And suddenly people will phone in and say, hey, there's somebody where they're not supposed to be. Go down and find out. And the crime rates went down. It sounds counterintuitive, but it's a different way of thinking. So one of the things I would say to you about in this exercise is, as Warren told you, think different. <laughs> you don't have to think the way that the list 
tells you to think. As I would listen to different presentations from EPA, from Environment Canada, and from everyone, they've spent a lot of time, and I grant them, I'd say, thank you very much for spending that time here. But they spent a lot of time hiring their own people to look at these issues and formulate wonderful <coughs> diagrams and charts and things. And then they come to us all excited and say, fill these out and we'll have good data that we can do work on. Think differently. How would your people do this? How would you do that work? With here at Aquasusli, we use the this way to evaluate. When the, it's interesting that when you get down into this neck of the woods, the sacred beings, the enlightened teachers, the creator himself or herself, they have nothing there. I remember telling somebody that we should do an, a spiritual environmental assessment. And they went. And you could see the poor lines just turning because they have no tools to do that. But we do. We know that we can go to our medicine people. We know that we can go to the elders and say, what is the spirit of this world and what we're planning to do? There? And how do we protect that? How do we look at it? And for us, there is a spiritual lesson. Yes. Uh, it's a environmental assessment. They said to me, well, uh, we don't do that. They said, well, yes, you do. Uh, you have ceremonies. Uh, I said, I've noticed that you have a sacred ceremony when you open a highway or a, a shopping mall uh, in which you invite uh, some great dignitary and he gets these big pair of scissors and you stretch an orange or a yellow tape across there and he comes out, pronounces great words about opening and wonderful and snips that thing and then everybody goes in. It's a wonderful ceremony, but uh, I don't know how it connects spiritually to you, but if that's the way you do it, that's fine. But we have other ceremonies that make us look at the way in which the world is. Okay. A lot of times, too, that we, when we talk at each other, we don't speak to each other. And I use these, these, because I want to criticize both sides, so you can throw rocks at me whenever you want to. But one of the things I hear all the time is Western science. And our people put real emphasis on oh, Western science is what's killing us. Or Western culture is what's doing it. What we have to realize is that we're using that as one word. And what it means is that Western science in this connotation is a process that is arrogant, ignores the people, and ridicules local knowledge and the local people. That's what we hate. We don't hate the guy, the scientist that comes into our community, lives with us, works with us, you know, does those things with us, and uses the skill that they have in order to they solve a problem, help us solve a problem. Those are good people. And our people have adopted those people into our communities and welcomed them. And they're one of the people that when you're I'll say the, uh, we're sitting around talking at, at the table. They're the embarrassing ones. Because they're the ones that we say, you know, those white people should all be th thrown away and put back where they came from. And then we know that notice that that person's there. Oh, except you, Jay. You're okay. <laughs> and it happens to us all the time. Why? Because it's this arrogant process that we don't like. In the same way with the culture. There's some beautiful things in uh, Western culture, and I'm trying to use that as two words, that help us and inspire us. The singing that we did, our opera singing yesterday, ah, wonderful things. We, is, that, is that Western culture something that we should learn? It's this dominator society is what we're worried about, that doesn't listen to anybody and wants to dominate nature. But when that society or people in that culture say, how do we work together? What do we do? And we say, that's, that's, those are good people. And again, we run into the situation where we say, oh, we shouldn't be doing that because that's not part of our culture. 
and our children say, wow, we, we like doing that. We like dancing. We like singing. We like hip hop, which I can't understand. <laughs> and again, it's an expression, a way in which we do, and we don't look at it as something that is foreign or unusual to us. From our side, uh, you hear this all the time, Mohawk people. Now, when we say it like that, or native people, we're saying it as it represents that ideal state, the ideal people in our community. And we all know that everyone in our community is absolutely perfect, right? Yeah, we all know the person down the end of the street that sometimes even our own people are worried about. Mm -hmm. But we use that term in order to exemplify the highest qualities that we give them. And we try to live up to those qualities as many of our teachers have been telling us. The same way I always like the concept of an element. If you go to Warren, he's not here today, but if you went to Warren and said, Warren, are you an elder? He'd go, oh, God, just, no. And I, people say to me, well, are you an elder? And I say, no, 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 hold it. I'm only 65. I want another 10 years to be irresponsible. So <laughs> try to keep that term away from me. Because as soon as I take it on, I have to be responsible. I have to be that person. And our people, I always say that, that to be an elder is an acknowledgement by your community or your group. It's not an appointment. And so you could have an elder who is 15 years old if that person exemplifies those things in your culture that is so important to you. The Dalai Lama is chosen from a boy by a group of priests or other lamas at birth, and they all know that that person is, will be the new Dalai Lama. It doesn't depend on age. It depends on the wisdom that the person has gathered with me. So this, I call it the ways of misknowing things. And when we don't listen to each other carefully, we misknow what we say, and the stereotypes come up. Traditional knowledge is some of the things that we've been talking about. And there are many myths associated with it. Um, just listed a few of them here. Uh, only Native people have traditional knowledge. All you non-Native people, I'm sorry, you just can't have it. You have to be like us. And I'm not so sure about my brother here, who's uh, of a little bit darker color. But why? Why do we make it that way? I, when we set up Kosiwik and the uh, Traditional Knowledge Subcommittee, one of the first things that subcommittee did was said to the big board, what about your own people? What about community knowledge? The knowledge of your own people. You realize that in Canada, the northern cod would not have been declared on the species list if they would have listened to their own people 25 years ago. If they had gathered that information instead of depending upon only the science that they had, they would have known that the cod are, are disappearing and they would have taken steps at that point. But Joe Bloggs down at the end of the road running his boat out to catch fish isn't a scientist and so therefore can't comment on this. I was saying this morning, in Akwazasli, when I want to find the turtles in my community, do you think I go to the elders to ask them? No, I go to the kids. The kids know where every turtle and this frog in this place is. Why? Because they're out there all the time looking. And so I go to them and I say, where have you seen this turtle? Oh yeah, it's down at the end of the street down there in the big pond. Do you know the big pond? The one on the side over here. Well, it takes me 20 minutes to find it because I haven't been at that pond. Do I quote that person? and say, uh, this information to me was given by uh, Jake Wazor, a scientist 10 years old, <laughs> who told me to show me where these were. No, we say, ah, as the scientist, I have discovered turtles. <laughs> My grandfather used to say that the Haudenosaunee discovered everything in this world, 
we even discovered radio. You know that? I don't know any of you probably. You'd probably think it was this Marconi guy that discovered the radio. There was a Haudenosaunee person in uh, St. John's, and he walked into the hotel room, knew where Marconi was, opened the door, and discovered the radio. You know, so. <laughs> <laughs> and how silly does that sound when we talk about this? In our community, we have scientists, we have people, we have observers. Those people are incredibly important to the process that we're talking about today. And their knowledge should be recognized. They say PK or is lost. It's going to be lost. Our elders are disappearing. Uh, it needs to be saved. And it's interesting to me because it's them that are saying this. And they say, well, we're going to store it in books, libraries, databases, maps. And that will save your traditional knowledge. Well, our knowledge is a traditional knowledge. And it does can be saved. Their traditional knowledge they store in libraries, like the Alexandra Library in Egypt. Oh, I'm sorry, it was burned down, it's gone, so all that knowledge has disappeared. However, the great law of peace that you hear, the words that come before all else, are just as old. And there's anyone in this community you can ask to give you that opening or talk to you about the great law. And even our children can do that. So where did we say this? What great tone is this written? Ah, it's written not in the hardware or the software of our people, but in the jellyware up here. That's where we keep all of our knowledge. And we transfer it from person to person, from generation to generation, from communities, different communities to each other. So that if my community Say, forgets what alligator dances were. So I know you were dancing last night. I'm sorry I wasn't here. Who do we go see? There are no alligators in the St. Lawrence River. I haven't seen one out there. Where did we get that dance from? Ah, that dance was, that, oh, you saw one. <laughs> um, that, that information was shared to us from the Seminole people. And we shared with them the bean dance. And if you go to the Seminole people, and you go to our people, you can see a dance that's probably been going on for 700 years. And we keep it. So that someday, maybe the Seminoles will forget their alligator dance. Maybe they'll forget some of that culture. And they can come back to their friends, the Haudenosaunee people, and we can show them how to do that. The same way your people all store the most important things among all of the people that surround you. It's the reason why our medicine people and we share with our own those ideas and things that we have. So that if sometime in the future, a Haudenosaunee, God forbid, should forget the great law, you now know it. <coughs> you now know how it operates. And maybe our people can come and learn from you. So, Again, some of these, they say it's static and doesn't change. Well, it changes very quickly, especially if you're a moose hunter or a caribou hunter or a polar bear hunter or being hunted by a polar bear. You really have to know what that is and the knowledge doesn't. It can change according to the seasons. And it's the reasons why when global climate change occurs that traditional knowledge becomes so important. When I listen to governments talk about this. It's like global climate change, now that we have funding for it, global climate change has started. So let us now begin to formulate the plan in order to see what we're going to do about it. Traditional knowledge says we knew 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 200 years ago, that global climate change was occurring. Everything that you've heard talking about the industrialization of North America, showed us that it was a terrible one. And only now our brothers are beginning to understand the implications of that change. And I think we have to work hard with them in order to make sure that they fold in the things that they don't understand. Anecdotal? Of course it's anecdotal. Natives love telling stories. 
and we sit and we tell great stories about thousands of years ago, and we think that's wonderful. And those stories tell us not only the way the situation was in the past, but also give us some type of moral understanding. One of the best stories I have that uh, is a good example is that in our tradition we have a flying a head of fire that occurred many, many centuries ago in our land. And uh, it's the reason why dogs are so important to us because this hunter is out in the woods, this flying head comes down. As soon as it touches anything, it incinerates it completely. And they were fleeing that flying head. And as they fled, they knew that they couldn't, they couldn't outrun them. And so the male dog said he'll stay behind and distract him and sacrifice himself. So he sacrificed himself, flaming head consumed. And again they ran. And because the dog knows that humans are not as fast as they are, he wasn't going to survive. And so the female dog said, I'll stay behind so that you may be able to flee and get away. And then he, she sacrificed herself. And so for that, we honor the dog. But what was that flying head? As a scientist, a biologist, and I'm very curious about our legends. I could dismiss it and say, oh, it's a fairy tale. It means nothing. Until I talked to my friend who's a nuclear physicist in the Navajo. And he said, do you know something, Henry? That's a very plausible thing that could happen in this world. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, there's an effect called the Pizarro effect. You have all seen it. It's the lighters that you get that make the spark, not the ones with the wheel on it, like clicking your bit, but the ones that you press, and suddenly there's a, a click, and a spark is produced, and the flame is ignited. That's called the Pizarro effect, because there's a crystal on the inside that you're putting pressure on, and when you release the pressure, energy is released that causes that spark. North America was a huge Pizarro effect. Where we are right now, 10,000, 15,000 years ago, there was seven kilometers of ice here. And the whole of the land was pushed down. Just so happens that most of this land here was all uh, preclaimed in a shield, and therefore heavy in crystals. It was pressed into the ground, and when that ice melted, it was released. Well, what happens in that little cigarette lighter? Suddenly there's a ball of energy that was released into the air, and it would travel all over the place, looking for a good conductor. And it just so happens, I'm a good conductor. Hit me with a couple hundred million volts and amps, and I'm incinerated immediately. So here's a nuclear physicist, Navajo, and myself discussing the legend today, and suddenly, I can describe what that looked like 15,000 years ago. It took us a little bit of time, a little bit of effort, but we now know what it was like then. And maybe what we need is, uh, under our risk prevention, is uh, a flying head uh, policy that will put up big spikes so that we can ground them before they come after us. I don't know when we have to do that, but uh, we know that our legends talk about it. It's not objective, I've heard that say. I found that working with truly great scientists, in many cases, they're not objective. They believe wholeheartedly in their, in their work that they're doing. And that they put that energy into it because they're not objective, because they want to look at it and find the facts and find the things out the same way our people do. And when we see that in another person, we see that light burning in their eyes, and we know that we want to look at it. They also say that it's uh, more mystical than factual. Well, stories tend to be, our stories tend to be mystical. And that TK is the same. So as a native person, TK is the same all over the world. You could take me and drop me into the Arctic on an ice floe, 
and Henry Lickers would survive because he's a native and he has TK. <laughs> uh, our great big polar bear come along, he'd be the first right off the bat to the there to help teach me what I have to know. And what I need to do is when I walk into somebody else's home or a territory, I have to humble myself. That's incredibly hard for what we're showing, but I have to humble myself. I have to be as a child. You have to take care of me, because I don't know the land. I don't know this place. If you come here, we have to do the same for you. We have to show you where the dangers are, and make sure that we take care of you, and make sure that it's done. So PK isn't the same. We use the concept here of that overarching thing. We use the concepts of knowledge, but it's Mohawk knowledge, Mohawk traditional knowledge, pre-traditional knowledge, Anishinaabe traditional knowledge. But what is the overarching one? And we use that called naturalized knowledge systems. It's naturalized because it's adopted uh, for common use in an area or naturalized for that area. It's like you can become a naturalized citizen of Canada. What do you have to do? You have to learn stuff in order to do that. The same way that if I come into Norma's community, I have to learn stuff in order to live there. I have to naturalize to her much area. And that takes time. You can't fly in one day and fly out the next day and say that I know all of the things in that area. The knowledge is a deep or extensive learning. It's a product of knowing. It's kept by those elders and people who live there. So the knowledge is deep and it, it can protect you. It's a system because it's a combination of all those things and we use it. The system passes it from one person to another, to one generation to another, and helps us live upon that land. I said to uh, if we use this, then I can have French Canadian knowledge here. Uh, we have barbot fishermen that come up and down the river and have been doing so for two or three hundred years maybe. They didn't learn anything? I don't know, but white people can be pretty smart. You know, they get pretty smart people. And they can learn where the barbot are. And they can work with us. And we can honor their knowledge. And they can honor our knowledge. And maybe we get a better understanding of the world. Next. Again, we talk about types of knowledge. So an innate knowledge is the knowledge that you're born with those things that you know, one from your, out of your mother's womb. Intuitive knowledge is the why and how things are. And sometimes we call this the tradition, the creator's knowledge. Navajo believe that there are no new words in the world. Every word that you need is here already. So I said to my friend who was that nuclear physicist, I said, what's the word for computer? And he came up with the Navajo word. I said, what does that mean? That means computer. I said, oh, okay. Yeah. What does it break down on? And he said, oh, he said, oh, you want to know how we arrived at that word? Well, that's a different point of view. And so he told me how they arrived at it. But they knew what the concept was. They knew how to manipulate that concept. He told me the moment that that whole word for laser. I said, ah, oh, come on, you guys didn't have lasers way back when. Oh, yeah. We draw them in our paintings. You know, the big lightnings that come down. And uh, I, who am I to argue with a nuclear physicist about lasers and stuff? But, but they have those. The same way we can do the same thing with our language and build it. The empirical knowledge is the knowledge that we gain from experience. And again, one of some of the things we're talking about here is what is that knowledge? And we say that you have harmonious knowledge or spiritual knowledge when you reconcile all of these together. And our elders and our people spend days talking about this. And that knowledge can change, but we're willing to share that next. We also have principles that we know exist for any peoples who live close to the earth. At first, being Henry Lickers and became the way I am, I didn't believe everybody had that. These white people couldn't possibly have that. Uh, that the earth is our mother. Cooperation is the way to survive. 
power, knowledge is power only if it's shared. Responsibility is the best practice. Everything is connected to everything. Fifth place is important, and the spiritual world is not distant from you. It's right here. And one of the things that I found was, in my travels, for example, in France, I was talking to, a, he called himself a peasant. His family had lived on that land for 1,500 years and had farmed that land. One continuous family there. And I tell you, when he talked about La Terre, La Terre was the Mother Earth. It was that place that gave him all and his family everything that he needed. And as I talked with other, other farmers in other places, that concept of the Mother Earth was there. When I went to Germany, I thought, oh, not here, because they talk about the fatherland. And I thought, oh, well, that's it. No, no Mother Earth here. Until I asked him, and he said, yes, we have the fatherland on the Mother Earth. And she's a very voluptuous looking lady. Mm -hmm. Big, uh, just amazing when they draw her in, in art. So I think people who live close to the land hold these principles or themes as important. And you people out there are beginning to see these and beginning to understand. It is not survival of the fittest. It is cooperation is the way we're going to survive. And we've known that. Uh, good stories in our, among our people about how rabbits and wolves cooperate together. And as an ecologist, we usually call that tricky prey relationships. And it takes a long time for the people to understand. All of these things are what exemplifies how we live. And so, what do you say? If your lifestyle is nested in the environment, you believe those things. But as you pull it out of the environment, those things start to disappear. Suddenly, you believe the Earth isn't your mother. That survival of the fittest is the only important thing. And as you go through those and lose them, your spirit and your people are disconnected. I like Paul Ehrlichman, in one of his books, wrote that economists are the only scientists in the world that believe the world runs on magic. It has no connection to the land or anything at all. It's just <coughs> magic. The magic of the marketplace. And how foolish does that sound to us? Some of the frameworks, we believe in responsibility to the world. Usually you, in a dominator society, you, you, it's based on what we call the legal minimum. So legally, what level do you establish a standard for? You a standard for the minimum amount that can be tolerated by that society. Uh, and so, again, you have problems with this. Scope, hierarchy is important to us. The great way of peace is the way in which we work. Cooperation here through contracts and agreements. And the environment is protect, environmental protection overrules economics. And in the outside world, we see that as being directed to us. This is just one thing because I've heard this a number of times as we talk about this. How do we look at scale? Uh, this again is another person and I think he was a part of it. Him and I were talking about this concept that you hear our people say if, that a cause is like dropping a pebble into the water. You drop a, a stone into the water, it ripples up. And that represents this concept of a hierarchy of cause and effect. I'm not going to, I'll show you the next one. This equation across the top is which with integral signs and a whole bunch of thought. I didn't put them up there because I'm not a math person in that way. But this is the way in which we think about the world. And so when somebody says to us, is global climate change occurring, we have to look at every one of these units. So, as an individual, how is global climate change affecting me? Well, geez, I'm, I notice it's getting much hotter than it was before, and I don't like the heat, so I'm living in the basement much more than I was used to be living up above. What does that mean to me? I don't got as good a tan as I used to have. 
Is that important? Oh yeah, it's important to me. To my family, how oh, is global climate change? We had a bumper crop of tomatoes this year, and it was the hottest year that we've ever seen. And we collected, couldn't hardly collect rainwater. We had to do a lot more watering. But the crop was amazing. So global climate change caused more tomatoes. Uh, is that good? Oh yeah, it means maybe I'll have good, good traditional foods like spaghetti over the, over the winter. <laughs> <laughs> to our group, I, or our community, was their impact. This year, there was a big impact as that change sucked up water, did things in our community that we were seeing. And depending on where the hierarchy is, we have to describe those and see them. We talk about the nation, the Mohawk nation, and how that would spread out to the Confederacy, because I'm a Seneca, these are Mohawks that lived here. So how did it impact on the Senecas? Well, we talked to the Senecas. We talked to the Unites, we talked to the Onondagas, we talked to all of them to find out. And then we're not quite, still not quite sure. So we may talk to other Confederacies, to the people who live other places, to the North. And one of the reasons that you're here is that we're reaching out into your people as well and saying, well, what's happening in your community? What are you seeing? How can we protect ourselves? Lastly, we know that the spiritual world surrounds us. So, is global climate change affecting that spiritual world? And I would say to you, yes it is. Ceremonies that we hold in Akwazasli, the thunder ceremonies, are performed when we first hear the thunder in the spring. And we send the grandfathers away, we say, when we hear the last thunder of the season, so that they can go to Florida and rest, and then be ready to come back and do what they're supposed to do. And what we're noticing is, period of time that we can send them away is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So what does that tell us? It tells us that all of those things that are under the ground that they protect for, maybe hydrofracking, are starting to get loose. They're starting to come up. And those thunders have to stay here more and more, stabbing the ground in order to make sure that they stay under the ground. Because if they get loose, we know that we're in big trouble. So there's a ceremony that spiritually tells us that we must be vigilant on this land. And I'm sure that in your communities, you have ceremonies that are tied to the, the land itself, and that you're watching those ceremonies shift. And that big concern to, us, to the medicine people and to the spirit people when you see them uh, This, I'll go back just one second. This. Uh, all the rest of this stuff is what him and, him and I saw. He's a mathematician, so he had all of this stuff, and we <coughs> went through it. I can tell you that uh, there is a mistake, and my daughter, and I remember the white man petroglyphs, uh, under individual, I said, uh, originally I was saying that the, uh, the size of the space of an individual is probably no more than two meters or three meters or four meters, even for elephants and her. No, Daddy, no, Daddy. The blue whale is much bigger. And so I had to readjust my scientific uh, <laughs> uh, establishment to take into account blue whales. Does this have a spear for myself? I'm Henry Lickers as an individual. I have a family of three grown kids. Uh, you can see how long ago I wrote that. 42 years, her and I have been together. Uh, I started the Department of the Environment here, now the science officer. I worked with the, the nation on species at risk at that time, but I worked with other nations. And I also had a scientific co-chair of the Haudenosaunee Environmental Task Force. At each of those levels, I have responsibilities that I have to fulfill. Is global climate change impacting on all of those levels? And I would say, yes, they are. How do I put that into those forms that I see? It requires a different way of looking. And it requires a different way of working together. I use this with my non-native friends because it, it's, but it in essence is a translation of the great way of the great mom. 
I use this concept, the uh, first time I used it, I kept thinking to myself, what catchy phrase can I use to get them? You know, some Hollywood of that, that will make them listen. And so I used the concept of the zeal to deal. Not the deal, but just the enthusiasm to do it. And in many ways, the great law of peace wants you to do that. It's creating that enthusiasm. And so, respect, equity, empowerment became those three words. But there are tools of respect. Understanding, communication, consensus building, mediation, honor. And you can use this to analyze where you fail. If you don't communicate well, which we'll talk about, then suddenly the deal falls through. Nobody wants to do it. If you don't understand each other and you talk past each other, the deal will fall through because you don't respect each other. And so these become not only the way in which you create that enthusiasm in the deal, but the way that you look at your success or failures. Equity that Oren used yesterday is not just finance. In a community, the biggest thing is the knowledge that they have, the networks, the personnel, social or political power. And yes, finance is there. And we say that equity has to be transparent. So that the Canadian government says to me, we'd like to work with you on climate change, and we're willing to give you $30,000 for all of your knowledge. Oh wait, that don't seem too ethical to me. It doesn't seem that the equity is even there. You know, somebody's getting a better deal than I am. And unless we figure out how to bring that together, boy, I really don't want to work on that. Deal. Empowerment says, do the task that you set up, application. So if we say we're going to do something, do it. Don't wait around. Don't plan another 16 plans. Go out and do it. I always like the beans. If I use this with my own family, I understand that the garden has to be done. I know there's work to be done. I get out there and plant the beans because if I don't, there's no deal. There's no zeal in there. My wife shows me that there's no zeal in there and tells me to get out there and plan. For academics, we talk about authorship. What's wrong with Henry Lickers putting Jake Lazor's name on my paper as the person who knows where those turtles are? I didn't find them. He did. He's my scientist that's working in the field to do that. And what does that do? It helps Jake Lazor in his reputation as a turtle finder. And I've seen papers at the Seawick in which I questioned the author, and the author said, no, I have no APK in this, this, this paper. And I said, what are you talking about? You go to the last page, and you went to Con River, a small native community in Newfoundland, and you talked to Mary Tuaxes. I noticed that that's a very common English name, right? <laughs> and you asked her where this mold or fungus grew, and she took you to that place. Does she know? Oh, yeah. I said, isn't that ATK? Who was she? Oh, I don't know. I said, it sounds like Malice to me. Oh, maybe not. So you have ATK in here. Why didn't you acknowledge her? Oh, I didn't think of it that way. Well, we have to start thinking that way. So authorship becomes one of those things. Elders, I think, should be on every paper we ever write because they are the authorities that we look to. We gain credibility, we build partnerships, and we accept responsibility. If we do it wrong, we say it's wrong. And we say, we've got to fix it. If we do it right, we pack ourselves on the back, have a big dinner, and we all happy about it. The other one is the concept of time. We talk about seven generations to come. Really easy to understand. You know those seven generations. Those are your family. If you sit, stand in the center, you know your mother. You know your great grandmother and your great grandmother. And you will know your children, your grandchildren, and your great grandchildren. So if you're standing here, of course you want to take care of this one. And so there's the seven generations that run. 
And we know those people. Those are not foreign to us. So we come back to again to this opening that we did. And in that opening, again, we have many things in that opening. But one of the things I'd like to say, stay with, have it stay with you, is why there are three great ways of peace. I always like to say there are ways of mischief, too. And we say that one of the big, uh, you know, almost compliments you can give to a child is, is that there's mischief is in his eyes. Because you know that that child is thinking different than anybody else. You know that you're going to have a handful of when you see this. So I would say to you all here, as children and friends of ours, think different. Start to think different about these things. My mother told me uh, when I was young, uh, I was always worried about you know, whether other, however people thought about me. And her comment to me was really simple. She said, dare to be great. You don't have to be great. Just dare to be. Have the courage to go out and do things. Try things. See if they work. Of course we'll fail. Of course we're going to fall. Of course we may not get it the first time around. But at least dare to do it. The other one that I always use too, which you all know, is it's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission. If you ask for permission, you'll find 1,600 plans and reasons why you shouldn't do it. If you just go ahead and do it, and say, oh, geez, I'm really sorry that we succeeded at doing this. You know, I'm really sorry, but we seem to have done a good job. Much better way of doing it. Work together. And that's work together in that concept of peace. We're working together here trying to figure out what we do. And whether we produce anything at this table, we now know a process that we can use. That's mighty powerful stuff. We can go back to our people and speak. The Haudenosaunee have a concept of a runner. A runner is a person who holds one up, who holds a message for other people. And he runs through all of the communities and says, here's what is important. The ice is melting in Greenland. This is changing in somebody's territory. We've seen this in Aquasasti. So now you've heard the stories. So now you are runners. And you can run to your communities and across the land to make sure that they hear that message. So work together. That's another way to do this. What's always when we get together in these type of things with Native people, sometimes the outside world has to be remembered. It's have fun. I belong to the Eastern Ontario Model Forest. And uh, they wrote the standard constitution for an NGO. And when they finished it, they went, oh, look at that. And I said, I want to be a member of this organization. They said, why? Well, you guys are all boring. You're not going to have any fun. I said, in your constitution, put, we'll have fun. <laughs> and they went, oh, well, we don't do that. Think different. And they thought different, and they put it in. Now they have to have fun. <laughs> oh, did we do everything? Yes, we did. Well, we haven't had any fun yet. Let's have some fun. <laughs> and fun is so easy to our people. Let's eat. Let's sing. Let's dance. Those make us want to do it more and more. The other one is, among our people, is you are not alone. I don't want any of you walking away from here thinking that you are. You may be working high in the Arctic by yourself, out on the tundra, not another person a thousand miles around you. Uh, but if you have a cell, uh, satellite phone, phone me. You're not alone out there. We know, we know each other. We are brothers, we are sisters. And you're not alone in your struggles. And by talking to somebody else in this world, you have the burden of pain. I always like that concept. If I share my pain with somebody, I've just cut my pain in half. And the more people I share it with, the smaller that pain becomes, and loneliness disappears. This is one of the problems that our children feel when they think that they're alone. 
The opposite side of it is when we work together and we do something good, now I have twice as much. I've just empowered us twice as much. If we have 10 people, we may have 20 times as much. It doesn't grow just one by one by one. It grows in great leaps and bounds. And lastly, I would say to you that in that form of the words of mischief, is that you will win. If you are right in what you're thinking about, you will win. Why? Because the other side can't keep up the fight as long as you can. Remember that seven generations? The Mohawks aren't going anywhere. We're going to be here forever. Domtar is gone. It no longer pollutes the river. CIL is gone because they no longer pollute the river. General Motors, it's just about there. I think they're tearing the building down now. And so, when we thought, think in these long terms, not only do we protect those people in the future, but we will pass the fight on to our kids. We'll pass the fight on to seven generations to come. And that law that on the fur buying that we, Norma and I fought off, and sometimes above ourselves say, well, we lost that one. Man, uh -uh. We will win that one in the long run because they can't keep up with stuff. And my kids and her kids and their kids get on them. So we will win in this. When you're saying about staying connected, no, we can do more about that today than we could ever in the past. Realize that uh, the Haudenosaunee people knew about the people on the West Coast. Um, in our stories, uh, the West Coast people out there had those big poles, very big, huge poles. They went right up into the sky. And those totem poles, held up the western sky. And our people went out there and saw them and said, wow, these are incredible people. They are fish people. They jump right into the water and they just swim all over just like fish. Wow. And of course in our legends, they morph into fish head people. I wonder what we morphed into, but that's a different story. But to the east, we knew about the Mi'kmaq, the Maliseet people, because they were people who protected eel, protected different things. They were different from the fish people on the West Coast. We knew about the people in the North. My grandfather used to tell me a long story about the people of ice and snow, that those people way up there, they built their houses on the snow. And to me as a young boy, wow, granted, did they have fire? Oh yeah, but they had to keep it in little pots. Little wee pots they kept the fire, and little wee flame. Well, you know, they can't be heated up too much or they melt. And so I knew that there were my friends in the north. And far to the south, there were the people of stone. Uh, they were a cruel people. Uh, they used to uh, eat people, and whack them on the head and kill them. And their buildings and houses were all made of stone. And you got to watch out for those people. And so as a little child, I knew, I knew these things. I ran into that in um, Hay River. I was billeted with a family who we were up there doing a uh, conference on contaminants. And sitting at the table with the Cree family, I was sitting there and uh, the kids were in the house because it was raining or snowing or doing something outside. And they were raising hell, running from one end of the house to the other, just going to beat the parents. And we were trying to talk as parents. And eh, the mother said, eh, they their kids, you know, and we're all, until we heard, crash, and something went over. And suddenly the mother said, rah, 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 something in Cree. And all the kids in the house stopped and looked at me. <laughs> what did I do? And the mother did the same. Oh, I'm sorry. It's a saying among our people that if you keep doing that, we're going to put you outside and the Mohawks are going to get you. <laughs> Poor kids. There was one sitting right there. <laughs> and the so our people knew each other. Nowadays, we can stay. We visit. Visit with us. If you're coming past this way, don't be shy. You've been here once. You're now our friends. Come and visit. 
There's another little invention that the hood machine makes. It's called a phone. <laughs> that you can pick up if you're feeling lonely or you're feeling you need some encouragement. Bonus. That goes for you guys too. The other, other people's here. Uh, what's this thing? Eel mail, eel mail, or email? Sorry. <laughs> email. We use that a lot nowadays. I, I even know my mother used to use it when, uh, when she. And the thing about us was, is that we use it formally, as if I'm talking to you, here and here. I wouldn't shout at you. I wouldn't use obscenity. I'm not going to be trying to be cruel to you. I use that with the pride that I feel in my friends. Uh, Google, I like that Google. You can uh, go ego surfing for me uh, if you put the quotation marks around it and put Henry Lickers in. God, you find just about everything I've ever done is on that page. It's a good place that I can I'll Google some of you people just to find out what you're doing. And we can use that in order to stay connected in order to understand what we're doing. The things that I handed out there, uh, you can find them on Google. Uh, they're out there. YouTube, uh, you can hear me talk about four or five different places. Maybe you won't want to, but it's out there. I know I found Norma a couple of times, and uh, some of the other people that I, Orrin, oh my God, he's almost got his own site. <laughs> you can go there and listen to those words again and hear them and see them and review them and say, do we know what, what was said? We also establish networks. Um, Norma and the friends on Pasiwik are my friends. When I go to the East Coast, I make sure I go and visit them. Uh, this year I went to uh, Blomenden Park, uh, Provincial Park. I stayed there for free for two weeks and all I had to do was talk. Wow, for a second, that's a really wonderful thing. I gave a presentation to the park on the turtles. And we had about 60, 70 people all sitting around the campfire at night listening to turtle stories. And the lady that was there, her husband sits on the seat. So there's the network. I got to stay in a provincial park for nothing. And why? Because I was a friend of a friend. Use those networks. When you need to try to understand, speak out, see them. And maybe once in a while, when we can steal enough money, uh, we'll have meetings like this. And we'll sit around and we'll eat good food, have some fun, talk about a whole bunch of things. And you know what? It's a pleasure to do that. I know that in our lives, all of us are extremely busy. When uh, a person says to you, what do you do in your community? And you say, I am the environmental science officer. You all know that there's a thousand more things that I have to do than just that. And we do it gladly. Why? Because it fulfills our responsibility to the world around us and to our communities. And so I say to you as the non-native people that are here, I, we, I always caution my graduate students when they work with me. I said, because I'll give you the caution. The caution is, once you come here, and once you get known by our people, we will never forget you, and we will find out where you live. <laughs> <laughs> you will be asked that. So there's the caution. I say this very, with great trepidation. You better be careful, because we will find you if you want to work with us. 